I truly hope and pray that Jesus is everything to you. That what we just sang there rings true in your hearts. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Uh, we've been in this passage for a while, but we're going to be in the, the latter part of it. We're not going to quite finish it today. Uh, but last week, we left off uh, in the narrative with the people of Israel uh, doing some specific things. They were bowing their heads and worshiping their God, and they were going and doing what the Lord commanded them. And so let's go to Exodus 12, 27 and 28, and we're going to refresh kind of where we left off. And we're going to just go to the last sentence in verse 27, Exodus 12, 27, it says, and this is right after Moses just told them what to do, and it says, and the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. This is a big deal because Moses and Aaron have been doing what the Lord commanded them, but not the people of Israel. The people of Israel have been silent since Exodus chapter 5, and so there's a sudden change here. Well, why the sudden change? Well, first, because God has revealed and made it very clear to them that through the plagues that he is the Lord, and beside him there is no other. These people, Israel, are without excuse. They have seen the eternal power and the divine nature of God, and they now know who their God is and what he is capable of. Of. And so because they now know it, they respond in worship and they respond in obedience because of their fear and their reverence of God. That's the first reason is that they bow their heads and worship and obey because of their fear and reverence of their God. They know who he is now. Second, they have this sudden change because they also finally have an example to follow. Since Exodus chapter 5, when Moses and Aaron first went to Pharaoh... The people of Israel have seen their leaders do as the Lord commanded them. I've been harping on this for so many weeks. Their obedience. They're doing what the Lord has commanded. God spoke and told Moses and Aaron time and time again. And in response, they worshiped and walked in obedience. And so the people of Israel now had obedient examples to follow. And so before we get into our text today, this makes us pause and ask ourselves two questions. First, are you worshiping and obeying your God or our God because of your fear and reverence of him? Is that why you worship our God today? Romans 1 is very clear. No one is without excuse. We have all seen his eternal power and his divine nature, just like Israel did through the plagues. None of us are without excuse. And so knowing who God is and what he's capable of doing, does that cause you to bow and worship Him, and to walk in obedience to Him. Do you worship Him because of who He is, what He has done, and what He is capable of? And second, are you obedient? Are you an obedient example for others to follow? Moses and Aaron were an obedient example for the people of Israel to follow. They saw their leaders time and time again worship and obey, worship and obey. Listen, our kids in this church and in our community need to see faithful, obedient followers of Jesus Christ. They don't just need to see good moral people going to church on Sundays. They need to see faithful, obedient followers of Jesus Christ. Our neighbors need to see faithful, obedient followers of Jesus Christ. They don't just need to see people going to church on Sunday and coming back and then nothing is different about their lives the rest of the week. They need to see obedient followers of Jesus Christ. Our co-workers need to see faithful, obedient followers of Jesus Christ. Listen, I know it may seem weird to say this, but our world is very deprived of faithful, obedient followers of Jesus Christ. Our world absolutely needs them, and so we need to be the example that this world needs. Because when you are, God is glorified, and people can see Jesus Christ through you, and that's what we want, don't we? We want people to see Jesus through us in this world. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants to work through us. And so be the example for the glory of God and the sake of others. Be the example that Jesus wants you to be. Worship and obey your God. Don't be ashamed of him. 
It's a good thing that the people of Israel went and did that the Lord commanded them. Because remember, it was time for them to listen and to take an unblemished lamb and kill it on the 14th day. It was time for them to obey and put the blood of that lamb on the doorposts and the lintel of their house. It was time for them to be ready to eat the lamb with bitter herbs and unleavened bread with their belts fastened, their sandals on, and their staffs in their hand. It was time for them to, it was time for them to live by faith in the blood of the lamb so that the last plague would not befall and destroy them. And it was time for them to remember their salvation and to understand that they have been saved to live a sanctified life. It's a good thing they worship and obey because the tenth plague was at hand. It's finally come. The day has arrived. And so I want you to imagine the scene. Imagine the scene. You had just been told from Moses the instructions of what to do. And you did it. You got your lamb. You held on to it till the 14th day. You killed it just like you were told to. You ate it just like you were told to. You ate it ready. You were ready to go. And then it was bedtime. Do you think there was a lot of sleep that happened that night in Israel? Absolutely not. I imagine there was not a lot of sleep for the Israelites, but I imagine a lot of the Egyptians were at home to sleep. Israel was awaiting the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn which would secure their deliverance and freedom that God had promised them. Just imagine the trepidation. Imagine the faith that you had to have in that blood on your doorpost. In our text today, we are going to see multiple things. We're going to see a distinction is made, a reversal happens, A promise keeper is in control, and a journey begins. We're going to unpack those things. But just remember, God is at work here in the lives of his people. Through this last plague, we are going to see some very important things that we need to understand in our own lives. And so let's read Exodus 12, 29 through 42. Another longer passage today, but it's always good just to read large sections of Scripture. Exodus 29, 12, 29 through 42. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait. Nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. This is a heavy passage when we get to this. We've been building up to it, and it's kind of an exciting story as we get to this. And even when we teach our kids this story, the story of the Exodus, it's one of almost like excitement and joy. But when you actually read about it, it's devastating, isn't it? It's devastating. Not a single house 
of, of the Egyptians was there someone not dead because they didn't have faith in the blood of the, the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. I mean, think about that, of what that did in their lives. And so listen, when we come to this passage, first and foremost, we see a distinction is made. A distinction is made. We are told at midnight, God struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. There was not an Egyptian house where there was someone was not dead. I hope I've made this very clear leading up to this passage that the destroyer is what it's called in, in the passage right before we read this. The destroyer visited every house in the land of Egypt that night. He visited every Egyptian house and he visited every Israelite house. The destroyer was on a mission from God. And so that destroyer was taking orders from God himself, showing up at each house in Pharaoh's kingdom, but it was looking for something very specific. Now, he was not looking for whether there were Egyptians in the house or if there were Israelites in the house. And this reminds us that there is no distinction when it comes to race or status with God. And this is how it's always been, and this is how it always will be. It's very clear here in the, in the Exodus, and Paul makes it very clear in Romans 10, 12. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing riches, his riches, on all who call on him, on all who call on him. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, anyone who calls on him is his. And so there is no distinction when it comes to race. So the destroyer was not looking for a specific race in each house. Rather, he was looking for something specific on the doorway. Which means that a distinction is made by the blood of the lamb. It's that clear. It's that clear. It's made, a distinction is made by the blood of the lamb. And you know the story. Those with the blood on their doorway the destroyer passed over. The households who had faith in the blood on the doorway received atonement through the blood of a lamb that was sacrificed as a substitute for their sin. It's that simple. By faith, they put the blood on the doorway. And God did exactly what he promised. He passed over them because of the sacrifice and the substitute for their sin. But those without the blood not the bluck, the blood. On their doorway, the destroyer entered. He entered the house. Those who did not have faith in the blood received a judgment for their sin, and the wages of their sin is always what? Death. The wages of sin is always death, and here specifically it was the death of the firstborn. And this was the case uh, from this was the case from the house of Pharaoh all the way down to the captive in the dungeon, which shows that not only is there no distinction when it comes to race, but there's also no distinction when it comes to economic classes or statuses. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how, matter how astute you are. It doesn't matter how morally good or bad you are. If you don't have faith in the blood, you will receive the wages for your sin, which is death. From the highest to the lowest, it doesn't matter. In this plague, God is doing something fantastic for us. He is declaring the basis for salvation. He is declaring the basis for salvation of how it is and how it's always going to be. He's making it very clear that there is a distinction between those who have faith in the blood of the sacrifice that God provides and those who do not. Those who have faith in the sacrifice experience mercy, they experience grace, and they experience salvation. But those who do not have faith in the sacrifice experience wrath and experience justice and they experience death. And it's on this distinction that rests the eternal destiny of every single human being that ever lives on this earth. Romans 3, 21 through 26 is very clear. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Check out this last part. 
whom God put forward, so through Christ Jesus, whom God the Father put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Doesn't this passage bring your mind right to Exodus 12? It should. Paul is making it very clear that there is no distinction when it comes to sinners. It doesn't matter what race you are, what economic status you are. We are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. All of us deserve God's wrath and death because of our sin. Don't forget that in your life. Do you understand this? Don't forget what the wages of your sin deserve. Because once you start forgetting that, then you start taking for granted what Christ did for you. Do not forget what your, the wages of your sin deserve, which is the wrath and the death that God brings. But Paul is also making it very clear that there is a distinction with those who are justified by his grace as a gift. The only people who are justified by his grace as a gift and experience redemption in Christ Jesus are the ones who received Christ by faith. That is it. The only people to receive salvation from their sins are the ones who have faith in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. And propitiation just means God's wrath wrath has been satisfied through the blood of Christ. Just like in Exodus 12, God's wrath was satisfied with the blood on the doorpost. And through the blood of Christ, his wrath was satisfied in that sacrifice. And it's because of his blood that our sins are passed over so that we can experience God's mercy, God's grace, and eternal salvation. The eternal destiny of every human being rests on whether or not they have faith in the blood of the Lamb. And for Israel in Exodus, it was the faith in the blood on the doorway, and for us it's faith in the blood of Christ faith in the lamb that was sacrificed as a substitute for our sin. And so right here at the beginning of verse 29, a distinction is made. A distinction is made and and is the basis for salvation. And so the question for you today is, do you have faith in the blood of the lamb? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? If you don't, I want to implore you to put your faith in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice and his sacrifice on the cross and the blood that was shed for you. Because if not, listen, your eternal destiny is hinging on this decision. And so please, I implore you, if you don't have faith in Christ, believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Repent from your sins and turn to him. And if you do have faith in Jesus Christ, I want the blood of Christ to be a constant reminder of who you once were and who you are now because of who Jesus is and what he did. If you do have faith in Christ, I pray that you do not forget the sacrifice and the blood shed for you on that cross. I'll be the first to admit it's easy to go through life forgetting about the sacrifice of Christ. It's easy to go through our daily mundane and not give a second thought to who who God is and what he has done for us. So a distinction is made, and it's the basis for salvation. That's the first thing we see here. The next thing we see is that a reversal happens. A reversal happens. Throughout the beginning of Exodus, there was one common theme that we saw from Pharaoh. We saw time and time again that Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. Back to the children's story, right? Moses, let my people go. And Pharaoh's always like, no. Right? That's the common theme. As the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh believed that nothing would befall him and could simp- in that he could simply do what he wanted. And so Moses asked for his people's freedom, and Pharaoh oppressed them even more. Moses asked again and again for God's people to be set free. God even sent plagues to reveal 
who had the true power in this world, but Pharaoh continued to deny God's power and God's people. But after midnight on that faithful night, and after the death of his firstborn, which again, he was perceived to be a god, and his firstborn son was perceived to be a god. So this was a huge death in the family for them. After that, a reversal happens first with Pharaoh. It's kind of comical, actually, if you really think about it. The Pharaoh never wanted to see Moses' face again. But the moment his eldest dies, what does he do? In the middle of the night, who does Pharaoh summon? Moses, right? I never want to see you again, and if I do, I'm going to kill you. Moses, come here, right? It's a huge reversal. In Exodus 11.8, Moses said one day, Pharaoh's official will bow down on his feet and beg him to get out of Egypt, and that day has come. It's arrived. Pharaoh also had treated the Israelites as slaves and refused to recognize their rights, but here he calls them the people of Israel, which means he recognizes their status as a free nation. Throughout Exodus so far, he doesn't say that, but here he says, listen, uh, get the people of Israel out of here, and so he's recognizing their status as that free nation. Uh, Another reversal for Pharaoh. Pharaoh refused to let Israel worship their God. In fact, he even claimed not to know who their God was in Exodus 5. But here he says, go and serve the Lord. And that word Lord here is not just Elohim. He uses the word Yahweh if, if he did. And so he's referring to Israel's God in this moment. Go serve your God, your very specific God who is yours. And then Pharaoh also refused for everyone to leave Egypt. And he said he could, they could not take any of their flocks and herds. But here, he said they can go take them all. Take all your flocks. Take all your herds. Take all your people. Just get out of Egypt. Because of God's power revealed through the 10th plague, a reversal happens with Pharaoh. He went from saying, who is the Lord? Make bricks without straw. And no, they may not go serve the Lord to get up. Leave me and my people and go serve the Lord, you and all your flocks. It's a complete 180 for Pharaoh. Pharaoh gave in to all of God's demands. You guys see that here? Every single one of God's demands that he has been demanding for quite some time now. And Pharaoh kept pressing against him and kept saying no and kept saying no. And now we get to the point where he gives in to every demand of God. And he grants Israel's unconditional release. And even pathetically at the end, did you see what he did? He asked for God's blessing. Get out of here. Go. And bless me also, please. It's comical, but it's also very disheartening. Because a lot of people, a lot of people today do the same thing. They want God's blessing without repentance. They want God's blessing without turning to him. They want God's blessing without loving him. They want God's blessing without doing anything according to what God wants them to do. It's a very sad state to live in. It's almost pathetic in some way. This reversal shows us that there is no winning against God. There is no winning against God. God will accomplish his plan and purposes whether you accept them or not. Do you understand that? He will accomplish his plan and purposes whether you say, okay, God, or not. Pharaoh gained nothing and lost everything because he was unwilling to repent from his sin and turn to the living God. He was unwilling to accept God's plan and his purposes in this world. And listen, you too will gain nothing and lose everything if you don't repent from your sins and turn to the living God. You too, if you don't accept God's plan and purposes in your life, you won't win. There is no winning against God. So instead of being against him, let's be for him because he is the one who is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Why not be for him now when it's before it's too late? And I know I'm talking to the choir here, but listen. Other people need to see this through us. There's no winning against God. So even as you have faith in God and you follow God in your life, there are going to be times in your life where you're going to try to win against him. 
you know what, God, you want to do this, but I want to do this. It doesn't work. And so that's the first reversal we see. A reversal happens with Pharaoh. Next, we see a reversal happens with the Egyptians. The Israelites listened to Moses, and on their way out of town, they asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And what happened? The Egyptians gave their silver and their gold jewelry and their clothing to Israel, to their slaves. Can you imagine that? Where it's, They're the slaves. They're the looked down upon ones, right? They're the ones who don't have anything. And yet here we see that they are just absolutely willing to give everything over to get these people out of the land. How does this happen? Well, the Lord has given the people favor in sight in, in the sight of the Egyptians, the very people who threw the Hebrew babies into the Nile, the very people who tried to kill all the sons, the very people who thought they were better than Israel. These Egyptians were put in their place. And because of God's favor for Israel, he, Israel plundered the Egyptians. Did you catch that in there? It says Israel plundered. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. I love, I love that God uses the word plundered here. Because the word plundered is a military term. It's a military term. It's an idea that you, you go in, you plunder, where, take everything that you want, and you leave, right? The Vikings were known for plundering their, their victims, if you will. This shows us that the exodus and leaving with all the gold, the silver, and the clothing was a victory for God's people. It was a victory for God's people, which means that it was also a, a reversal happens with Israel. It's very clear here that Israel went from slaves to conquerors. They went from slaves to conquerors all by the power of God. They were slaves in Egypt for so long, but yet they left Egypt carrying the spoils of God's victory. They went out of Egypt triumphantly in the sight of all the Egyptians while the Egyptians were over there burying their firstborn. Talk about a victory from God. And this is the same for you and for me today. We went from slaves to sins to conquerors of sin through Christ who has loved us by shedding his blood for us on the cross. And the, through this reversal, we now get to serve the Lord our God. This makes me think of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 14. And you've heard this. It says, thanks be to God. I love that, I love that statement. Thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. When they left Egypt, Israel was not leaving bogged down. They were not leaving. They were walking out of there triumphantly because of the, the plunder, plundering the Egyptians and walking out of there with all of that stuff. And then it says, And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere, for we are the aroma of Christ, of Christ to God among who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one a fragrance from death to death the other a fragrance from life to life and so I think about this th them walking out of Egypt triumphantly all because of God's power and God's victory in their lives and that's the same exact thing that happens with us we also get to walk triumphantly in our lives because we are not slaves to sin anymore we are slaves to righteousness and because we're slaves to righteousness we are now conquerors and in fact the bible says we are more than conquerors through christ who has saved us and so by faith in christ you are a conqueror you are not a victim you are a conqueror and so live like one walk like one understand who you are because of what god has done in your life through christ and so we see a reversal happens. So a distinction is made, and it's made based on the blood of the Lamb. And then we see here a reversal happens with Pharaoh. He went from no, stay, make bricks, to go, get up, get out of here, serve the Lord. A reversal happens with the Egyptians. They gave Israel everything. A reversal happens with Israel. They went from slaves to conquerors, and so do we. And next, we see that a promise keeper is in control. A promise keeper is in control. We're told, we're told in verse 42, Exodus 12, 42, it says, It was a night of watching by the Lord. 
to bring them out of the land of Egypt. This means that God was working the night shift that night. The night shift of salvation in order to deliver his people from death and from Egypt. He was watching to make sure that salvation came just the way he promised. And so let's go, we're going to flip in Exodus here a little bit. So go back to Exodus 3.8. Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. It says, And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to stop there. And so right here in Exodus 3, 8, we see very clearly that God promised to rescue his people, to bring them out of Egypt, into a good and broad land. Now, go a little further to verse 20 in chapter 3. Verse 20. God says, So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Do you see another promise here? God promised that the Egyptians would let them go would not let them go until he strikes them with all the signs and wonders. And once all those signs and wonders are done, then guess what? They're going to be able to leave Egypt. They're going to be let go. And that's exactly what we see happen in chapter 12. Now look at verses 21 and 22 in chapter 3. And I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. In other words, you're not just going to leave as slaves. You're going to leave as conquerors. But each woman shall ask their neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. There's that word again. You're not just going to uh, take these things and, and flee. You're going to walk out triumphantly in procession with all this stuff. And so here we see that God promised that they would not leave empty-handed. And we get to Exodus 12. Guess what? Are they empty-handed? No, they're not. Let's go to chapter 6, 6 and 7. What a beautiful noise the pages are. I love it. It's a great noise. Exodus 6 and 7. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians." We see here very clearly that God promised that when he saved his people, they would know that he was their God. And they absolutely know that he is their God because they worshiped him and they obeyed him. Uh, Go to 7.5. I got two more for you. Go to 7.5. Exodus chapter 7 verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt, Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. We see here that God promised that the Egyptians also would know that he is the true God. And then the last one in 12, 11. So let's go back to Exodus 12, verse 11. Exodus 12, 11. In this manner, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it with haste. It is the Lord's Passover. God promised that they would leave in a hurry, and guess what? We get to Exodus 12, the end of it, and they left in a hurry. They had to be ready to leave. Listen, on the night of the final plague, 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 all of these promises came true, every single one of them. Every single promise came to pass just as God said he would. And when you dig even deeper in Scripture, you see some other promises fulfilled, especially from Exodus. God promised all the way back in Exodus 15, 14, that his people would be rich upon leaving the land. And this happened because God gave his people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. 
God promised all the way back in Genesis 12 too that his people would be a great nation. They came to Egypt with 70 sojourners. Do you guys remember that from Exodus 1? 70 sojourners, that's it. And then when we see them leave here, they numbered 600,000 strong. And God also promised back in Genesis 12 too that the nations would be blessed through the seed of Abraham. And we see here very clearly in verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them and very much livestock and both flocks and herds. And so God promised that the nations would be blessed. And now not just Israel is leaving, but a mixed multitude went with them. And so there's some Egyptians left with them, which we've already talked about in Acts 2. Guess who's there receiving the, the spirit? Some Egyptians, which is pretty amazing to think about. And so listen, when you get to Exodus 12, a promise keeper is in complete control, which is a pretty amazing thing to think about. He is in control of the whole situation. This didn't happen by chance. This didn't ha- God was not surprised that Pharaoh finally was like, you can go now. He wasn't like, oh, it, it worked. No, God knew exactly what he was doing. He was in complete control. He promised it. And he came through in his promises. That promise keeper is our God. And so what are we to do with that? Well, first, we are to believe in his promises. You and me today. Believe in the promises of God. As you live your life and things don't go your way and things are pretty hard and things just blow up in your face, we have a promise keeper who is in control of everything which should cause some peace to reign in your heart and in your mind as you walk through life. There are people in this room today who are hurting immensely because of certain things going on. And just remember that a promise keeper is in control of even your situation right now. He is a promise keeper that we can believe in. He is a promise keeper that we can trust in And so we can come to his word and we can trust what he says in here to be true. Because it comes to pass time and time and time again. And all the prophecies about the future, guess what? Those will come to pass too. I'll I'll bet money. I know we're not supposed to bet as Baptists, all right? But I'll bet money on the promise keeper, all right? Aren't you so glad you're not the one in control? The amount of promises that I've broken to my kids alone the last week is astounding. Can I have candy? Yeah, maybe later. Well, later never comes, right? And they tell me about that, right? Or promises to my wife. Hey, can you do this for me? Absolutely, hon. I promise I'll do it. And then I never get around to it, you know? That lets her down. And yet, I have to apologize because I don't come through on my promises all the time. But at least I can point my wife to someone who does keep his promises, which is our God. The last thing, we see a journey begin. A journey begin. We're told some facts, if you will, about their their journey. So the tenth plague happened. All the Egyptian houses, there was not a house without someone dead in it. They were groaning and mourning. The Israelites plundered the Egyptians. They had all their stuff. They were ready to go. And at that on that night, they left. They absolutely left and began their journey of faith into the wilderness. And so first, we see the route of, a, of the Exodus. We see the route of the Exodus. We see in verse 37, And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. And so they journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. Now, where these locations are, it's uncertain. People speculate. People can try and uh, say, yeah, this could be it, that could be it. Uh, But what is certain is that God is leading them out of Egypt and into the wilderness like he promised them so that they could serve him. That's what's certain. We don't know the exact route they went to, but we do know that God led them out of Egypt and into the land that he wanted them to go into. And so we see that route. Second, we see the size of the Exodus. 
we see the size of the exodus. Listen, you cannot picture a small crowd in your mind. You know, all the little cartoons of them walking through the Red Sea, it's like, you know, they try to make it look like a lot, but I don't think we can fathom 600,000 people in one area. More than 600,000. There's some debate on this number as well. So there's debate on the route they took, where they went, but there's also some debate on the actual number. Some people are like, well, 600,000 plus women and children, that'd probably account to 2 million, but if they had 2 million people, that's probably more than Egypt had themselves. And so the slaves would have absolutely been able to destroy Egypt because they had more people. So, so a lot of people are like, well, we don't know exactly what the number is. Depends on how you read that. But what is certain is that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt just like God said they would. So no matter what the number was, God got every single one of them out of there. Period. All right? And then the last thing is we see the date of the Exodus. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. 430 years. And this number fits with the prophecy that God gave to Abraham when he said that his offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not there, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. So the prophecy says 400, but in Exodus we see 430. So which is it, right? Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? No, it doesn't. What matters is that these dates are debated, but what is certain is that Israel left Egypt right on schedule. Right on schedule, on the very day that God planned, that God ordained, they walked out of Egypt according to his counsel. That's all that matters. And so you can't get into the weeds with the route, the size, the day. All you can do is understand that their journey begins and they leave how God wanted them to leave, the, the amount of them left that God wanted them to leave, and when they left was according to God's own counsel. That's all according to God and his will in this exodus. And so today in our text, we saw very clearly that a distinction was made. A distinction was made not by race or economic status, but a distinction was made by whether someone had faith in the blood of the lamb or not. And that is the basis for salvation for the rest of history whether you have faith in the blood of the Lamb in Jesus Christ or not. We saw that a reversal happens. Pharaoh absolutely tried to win against God, but he couldn't. So he reversed his action, and he said, get out of here. We saw the, the Egyptians reverse their actions. Instead of treating them as slaves, they gave them everything. We saw Israel, their reversal from slavery to sin, slaves to conquerors. And then we see that a promise keeper is in control, and we see that a journey begins. Now, when you look at this list here, it's actually pretty amazing because this is our story as well. Every single one of us who has faith in Jesus Christ, first, a distinction is made. If you have faith in Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed on the cross for you, guess what? The destroyer, or in other words, the wrath of God has passed over you. Right? You, you have salvation from your sins because of the blood of Christ. A distinction has been made on you in your life. And when that happens, guess what? A reversal happens in your life. You go from being dead in your trespasses to now being alive in Christ. Do you get that? And so when that distinction is made by your faith in the blood of Christ, a reversal happens. You go from dead in your sins to now alive in Christ. And this is all based on not your will, but the will of the promise keeper who has kept his promise of Jesus Christ coming and saving people from their sins, his people from their sins. And now we have a promise keeper that we can trust as we go on our journey of faith. They had to go on their journey of faith, trusting in the God who just delivered them. And we, too, go on our journey of faith, trusting in the promise keeper who has delivered us from our sins, who has brought us from death to life, all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you guys see that the Exodus story is your story as well? Do you guys understand that today? How grateful are you for our God and for the sacrifice of Christ in your life? Does that even, does that hit you 
in your heart somewhere? Have you even thought about it recently in your life? So many people take what God did for us for granted. And it breaks my heart that we forget this. It breaks my heart. And so what do we do? What's your next move? What do we do with this? Well, first, put your faith and hope in the blood of the Lamb. It's that simple. Amen. Faith and hope. Those Israelites had faith in that blood, or else they went to put it on their doorposts. They had hope that that blood would suffice and that the destroyer would pass over them. And God came through on his promise, and that's exactly what happened. And so you too need to put your faith and hope in the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ. Have faith that Jesus lived perfectly, died willingly, and rose again victoriously. Second, live as a conqueror. Listen, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are slaves to righteousness, which means that we are more than conquerors through Christ who has saved us. So live as a conqueror, understanding the victory that you have through Christ. Because that idea, that mentality that you are a conqueror through Christ doesn't mean you can go and thinking you're better than people. You understand that? So I'm not saying go act like you're better than people. What I am saying is live in confidence, in in confidence to Jesus Christ. Live as a confident follower of Jesus Christ knowing that he is leading us triumphantly as the aroma of him and as the fragrance of him in this world. So live as a conqueror. Third, trust that the promise keeper is in control. Trust that he is in control. His promises will come to pass, and we can trust that what he has said will happen. And no matter what, we have someone we can look to who doesn't fail when we fail time and time again. And last, on your journey of faith, look to Jesus. Our journey began, some of yours began a long time ago, some of your journeys began recently. It doesn't really matter where you're at on the journey because it never ends until you stop breathing on this life. Your journey is is still going, and so we need to Continue to run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. May we journey in our faith, looking to Christ for all things, because he is the one who's leading us. And we're going to see a lot of that happening after Exodus 12. I can't wait to get to that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We thank you for how humbling it is that you remind us this, this distinction and this basis for salvation. You remind us uh, that, that we are no longer slaves, but we are conquerors. You remind us that you are the promise keeper. You remind us that we are on this journey of faith and we get to look to you and follow you in all things. And so, God, may we never forget or take for granted what you have done for us. Help us to continue to have faith in the blood of Christ no matter what. As we journey and are tempted to lead, leave you and stray from you, Lord, I pray that you would continue to bring us back to you like you do those wandering lambs. God, if there's anybody in this room who, today who doesn't have faith in you, Lord, I pray that you would open their hearts, that they would repent from their sins, that they would turn to you as their Savior and Lord. God, because we all know, hopefully, that we desperately need you because we're all sinners and fall short of that glory. And so we give you all the glory today. We ask that you would work mightily. We pray this in your name. Amen.